Hey squad, it's me, it's your girl, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and a woman who loves to talk about money. Today I'm alone. All by myself. No, seriously, I'm alone today because it has been a very long time since I have done an audience Q&A for ye old podcast. Um, we have some really exciting guests that we're lining up, um, some really cool stuff that we're gonna be talking about in the coming months, but um, I wanted to just kind of check in with everyone, answer their questions, hang out, wear my fluorescent chartreuse sweater for those who are watching the video portion of this, um, and just kind of vibe, you know? it's It really has been a minute. So we put out the call uh, to questions um, and I got some really great and some honestly kind of hilarious ones. Um, so I'm gonna go through those. Uh, to give you an update, we are currently doing our Love and Money tour here at TFD this fall. Um, we did Chicago. I'm doing Philadelphia on October 30th. We'll link you to that in the description if you want to come join us. It's going to be a really fun event where it's like a live podcast recording of this podcast um, where we talk about love and money um, because the Philadelphia one is on October 30th. It's going to be the theme is like love and money horror stories. So it's going to be really fun. I'm doing that one with Ryan Houlihan, the host, uh, my really good friend and the host of Too Good To Be True. So I'm doing that, that's been good. Um, weather in New York is touch and go, but we're having a lot of like crispy, beautiful fall when Harry met Sally days. I am getting bookshelves installed in my apartment, uh, which is very exciting. Probably one of the most exciting things I've done all year. And just generally life is good. I had a very, very busy summer where I bit off way more than I could chew, quite frankly, doing my novel and my book tour for the novel on top of my actual job and all of my, you know, personal commitments. I like looking back definitely should have taken a sabbatical from work for at least like a couple weeks or something because I fully had like a minor breakdown this summer and just dealt with some really unpleasant stuff. But now things are looking up. I'm watching a lot of television. Um, I'm having a lot of friends over. Um, I'm just enjoying myself and remembering that there is more to life than constantly sort of <laughs> Uh, hitting deliverables, um, which was a huge part of this year. So we're settled, we're enjoying ourselves. We're all about that hashtag slow life in the Fagan household. Um, so yeah, I am really excited to be answering some of these questions and just chatting with y'all. So let's get into these questions, man. Man, oh, also on the tour, I'm definitely gonna be coming to Toronto, so stay tuned for that. We may hit like one or two other cities. Um, we're just finalizing some dates. I think I might be in Miami. Um, yeah, like keep, keep your eyes peeled and your ears to the ground. Thanks to Kelly Blue Book Service Advisor for supporting TFC. Kelly Blue Book Service Advisor provides confidence you're getting the right price for your repairs and connects you with local service providers. Plus, it has information on common car problems and current recalls. Learn more at kbb.com or click the link in the episode description. And thanks to Delete Me for supporting TFC. Remove your personal info from data broker websites. And we have a special discount for you. Get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash TFC and use promo code TFC. How are things with TFD? What's coming up? Um, things with TFD are good. Uh, to be honest, it was kind of a stressful year for A, the reasons that I listed, um, but also B, because like ad sales and digital media generally and social media have been really volatile. Like it's just increasingly hard for, um, you know, content creation on the internet and making you know, basically anything in digital media. It's, you know, luckily we've, you know, been able to weather the storms for 10 years. Um, but it definitely, like, we've had a really good Q3, like the fall or like late summer of this year, but we had a really tough Q2, like the early summer. Um, so, you know, it's been up and down. I think for me, part of like redoing the channel was really just trying to take stock of what I actually enjoyed creating and thinking about ways that our team could work on more satisfying projects that were, you know, of higher quality and 
just really focusing on that because I feel like working on social media, you can get so bogged down with just like constantly chasing those quick algorithmic hits and just putting out content on like a never ending loop. And it really got to the point where I was like, actually, I'm not enjoying this right now. I'm not enjoying this cycle. I'm not enjoying this cadence. I'm not enjoying this format. Um, so that was a really big, you know, shift. And that has been for the better. Also, we have some really exciting projects coming up for 2024 that I can't announce yet. Um, but they're going to be huge. It's also going to be our 10th anniversary year, which is honestly crazy. And something that I, when I think about 10 years in any industry, like that's so long, but especially in this industry, like everyone that I know who works in media for the most part is like, they've gone through several jobs in that time. They've worked for like several websites and magazines that have like laid everyone off or gone out of business or pivoted and then pivoted back. Like, it's been such a volatile industry. So obviously I feel really grateful, but I also feel very sort of like, I really want to take next year to think even more critically about, you know, what does the next 10 years look like? D what does the legacy media company look like in, in 2023? Um, it can sometimes feel like a lot of pressure, but it's also really fun questions to be asking. So overall things are existential, but good, I would say. What is the best reply to give family members constantly asking when you'll have kids when you are on the fence? Um, quite literally, f them. Truly, f them. I truly cannot stress this enough. I, I wish if I could give one thing to everyone listening to this, it would be like in that scene in the Nightmare Before Christmas where the professor like takes out a little bit of his brain and puts it into Sally. I can't be the only one who remembers this. Anyway, I would take out a little piece of myself that is the piece that truly DGAF what other people think about my personal life choices and give it to all of you because literally it does not matter. Like, I cannot stress to you enough. Like, if there are people, now don't get me wrong, we're not talking about like, I don't care what other people think. Like I walk through my life like a tornado treating people however I want to and their opinions are irrelevant. Obviously no, like we all have to share a community, a society, whatever. Like you can't be acting like, a, you know, a crazy person and expect to, you know, get along and still have close relationships and all that, obviously. But I'm not talking about like someone taking issue with the way you treat them or the way you talk or whatever. I'm talking about people taking issue with your personal life choices that have literally nothing to do with them and are none of their business. Like that is such an important distinction. And if you have people in your life who are making you feel guilty, anxious, uncomfortable, inadequate, insecure, whatever negative sentiment about your personal life decisions that do not involve or affect them, like, and it's not to say like, oh yes, if you were to have children, like other people in your life would, they would be affected one way or the other, but that is literally not their choice to make and absolutely none of their business. Like if you have them and they're happy about that, great. It's a bonus for them, but that is in no way their right to impose their will on or make you feel any type of way about like being able to distinguish the opinions that do and don't matter and to truly emotionally release the ones that don't matter. Like you may not be able to get this person out of your life or to, and you may not be in a place where you're like, I'm going no contact or I'm just not going to talk to them anymore, whatever. But like, at least internally learning how to just gray rock that shit and, um, you know, I look up the term gray rocking, but it's basically just like becoming an impenetrable wall to people who are throwing, you know, unhealthy, toxic stuff at you. Um, and just having that really solid internal boundary. Like it's not even like a physical boundary. It's like, you can say anything you want. Like when p people in my life, I won't say who now, when they say, when they make snarky comments about my choices, I literally, it, it truly, I feel like it's just the monkey clanging symbols in my head. I'm like, I could not care less. This is irrelevant to me. And the fact that you feel so entitled to give me your opinion on this and to make me try and feel guilty about this, like it makes me value your opinion so much less on literally everything else. Um, so learning how to make the, to distinguish between something, a thing that is valid for another person to have an opinion on, like for example, again, like, 
if you're treating them a certain way, or if you're doing something that might be harmful to yourself, or if there is like a legitimate reason for concern, or you've asked for their input, like those are all legitimate reasons for someone who cares about you to have an opinion. So that's one axis, right? Is like, what should they have an opinion on that matters? The other axis is who gets an opinion, right? Because like, even for the stuff that matters, we do ourselves an incredible disservice by broadening the circle of people whose opinions we take into counsel. Like that circle should be small. And like, you can nod and smile, from randoms or from people who you barely know or who shouldn't have an opinion on anything. But like that like Venn diagram of a person whose opinion I actually want to take into counsel and means a lot to me and a topic on which they should legitimately have an opinion, that's a small, that's a narrow window, right? And everything outside of that window, gum. It does not matter. And the sooner you can just truly emotionally gray rock that stuff and not let it affect you and just be like, it, this literally doesn't matter. It is just white noise. And if I can't get you to stop, then I'll at least like completely emotionally tune you out, the better off you will be. I cannot stress that enough. Like life is just frankly too short and already hard enough. Um, and especially as it pertains to the kid thing, it's so gross because like, what's the, what's the goal here? Forcing people who don't want children through guilt into having them and creating more children with parents who have no business being parents. Like that stuff kills me too, because like one thing that truly boggles the mind is that like we are so keen to try and force everyone into being parents. And yet we all know in our own lives, it could be ourselves, it could be people close to us. Like everyone knows someone who has parents, at least one, if not both. Everyone knows people who have bad parents, parents who are abusive, parents who are narcissistic, parents who are toxic, manipulative, controlling, bigoted, any number of things. There are so many people who would have been better off not being parents, um, or at least did not have children at a time when they were ready for it. So the idea that you would try to pressure someone who's already not into it into like, here, make this, make the most significant life choice you could ever make to make someone else happy, like, it boggles my mind. So people who pressure other people into having children in any capacity or guilt them or shame them or anything like, to me, if you do that, your opinions on everything are invalidated to me. Like I, you have nothing to teach me because you clearly are like on the most fundamental level have just piss poor judgment. Rant over. How do I stay resilient and work toward my financial goals when it feels like I'll never achieve them? Two things. One, assess your goals because if your goals feel totally unachievable, then you probably need to at least sort of rethink how you're going about them and like your benchmarks and your cadence and all of those things. Because if goals do not feel achievable, just on a purely psychological level, it's going to be very difficult to sustain them um, and very difficult to integrate them into the rest of your life. So you need to create goals that feel manageable. That could be breaking them up into a lot of micro goals. That could be, um, you know, rethinking some of the bigger picture stuff. But in general, you have to make sure that it's something that you can feel truly motivated about with plenty of checkpoints to feel like you've made progress. The other thing is like in terms of those checkpoints, like you also want to celebrate along the way. Like I talk about this all the time on my TikTok. Well, not all the time, but I do talk about it on my TikTok. Like for me, a hugely important mental shift in everything you do, but especially as it pertains to motivation, confidence, clarity around your ideals and around your goals and values and um, your interests is like, Remember that you not only can you die at any time, like you're definitely going to die. And like it is it could be soon. It could be sooner than you think. You are not guaranteed health. You are not guaranteed longevity. You are not guaranteed stability. Like anything could happen at any time. Now, statistically, it probably won't. But we can't spend our lives in a constant state of deferring what brings us joy and what gives us value and meaning. So that means that there needs to be tons of moments along the way of any long-term journey where you are celebrating your victories. And that could be small ways. That could be little treats, little moments with friends or partners. It could be as simple as like taking a, you know, a muse going to a museum that you want to go to on a free day. Like you can make it as budget friendly as you want, but making sure that you are taking taking a lot of time, um, a lot of moments along the way to celebrate and be present and 
reward yourself for making good choices is not just important to stay motivated, although psychologically it has huge benefits. It's also important because we have to be realistic that like we're never guaranteed to reach the end of our goals. We're never guaranteed to like have that pie in the sky moment. And like, yes, we should save for retirement because financial uh, health is usually about playing the odds. And the odds are that you will want to retire someday and you will reach a certain age where that is um, necessary or desirable. But you're also not guaranteed to reach retirement. So it's not healthy either to defer every moment of joy and being present in, in your accomplishments until that time. So I really do think balancing those two things is key. Um, play the odds, but celebrate along the way is definitely my, my biggest um, takeaway. Can you talk about the financial aspects of your international marriage, prenup, validity, et cetera? So to your point, our marriage is like ludicrously complicated from a financial perspective because not only are we married from two different countries, but we, my husband also, as some of you know, was like kicked out of the country for two years. And so was like fully working and being paid and paying taxes in a different country than me for two years. On top of that, like, I have two businesses that I have the majority of my income through, TFD and then my my book. So we got hella LLCs, hella taxes and hella countries. Like we, it is just chaos. Like we had to search high and low to find an accountant who could even deal with this because it's so, so, so complicated. And even that accountant, it's like a constant Sisyphean ordeal to be doing our finances as a couple. That being said, we do have um, some uh, financial parameters around our um, around our finances. We have like, for example, my husband has some ownership stakes and is in the operating agreements of my LLCs when because he's helped me with them. Um, we have um, all kinds of things in place for like if something happens to either of us. Um, you know, and we we do our best to make sure that both parties would be really taken care of in the case of any kind of like separation. But like, for example, we have I mean, not like substantial assets, but we have assets that are not even in this country. Um, and my husband, again, was like paying taxes and being paid in another country for years. So while we like just after we got married. So even based on what we have, like it would probably be like a very protracted and difficult um, you know, financial situation to parse out. That being said, like the process of him getting a green card was so honestly traumatic in and of itself that, um, you know, we just kind of felt like, uh, we just focused on that. And honestly, like we weren't like, we didn't even like have a will between us until fairly recently, which like, I'm honest, honestly kind of embarrassed about, but it just felt like it was falling to the bottom of the, um, to-do list. Like I had protections in place for my business, but like between the two of us, like certain, we only have recently put certain thing in, things in place if something happens to either of us. So we've definitely been playing catch up with some of our finances. Um, but I would say like international marriages are just go always going to inherently be very complicated again, especially if there's any kind of long distant or dual country component that was nightmarish honestly. I fell off budgeting and my spending has spiraled. I feel like I know what to do, but I can't make myself do it. Any suggestions? So executive dysfunction is really hard to give advice on. Like knowing that you should do something and not doing it, like obviously that can be a symptom of a lot of mental health issues. Um, and that is something that is very hard to just prescriptively be like, we'll do the thing, right? Like, because obviously you know what you need to do, you're just not doing it. Um, for me, I have certain things that I'm very avoidant about. And what I like to do is I cluster them all into a very like Pomodoro methods, very short period of time. And then I specifically build in a reward for myself once I do those things. So like an, a common example for me is like, I'm very avoidant about making medical appointments and actually going to them. It gives me great anxiety. So I will do them all in one day within like an hour period. I will just like bam, 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 make all the, like all the appointments, do everything I need to do. And then I will always like treat myself to something really delicious or like a, a gift. Now, is that treating myself like a literal toddler? Maybe. Um, or like a golden retriever. I'm like giving myself a treat maybe, but it to me is very helpful. That being said, I think 
sometimes when it comes to these avoidant issues, because I used to be like that with my money a thousand percent, like I used to go months without looking at my bank account statements because I knew nothing good awaited me there and I was incredibly anxious about it and it led me to spiral further. I think sometimes with these issues, A, I think if it's at all accessible to you, mental health is like therapeutic resources are very important to something like this because they often just spiral into pure mental health issues and they're no longer like in the realm of reason. They're in the realm of like you need to, your brain needs some help. Um, But I do think at least for me, like sometimes you just have to come to a point where you're so frustrated with yourself that you're like motivated to make a change and very few things outside of it will really truly motivate you. So I hope you come to that point soon if you're not already there. Um, But that's just what's helpful to me. Um, Each person is going to be a little bit different. Kicking yourself in the ass can be one of the hardest things you ever do. So I definitely empathize with where you are. And I've been there, trust me, many times, including about that exact issue. So anyone who watches my show knows that I famously have not driven in 10 years, but I did used to drive quite a bit and relied on my car every day. And when I did, I was actually a huge Kelly Blue Book user because as someone who was, uh, let's just say not killing it financially uh, and had to be really cost conscious about what was at the time one of the most important things I owned, AKA my mode of transport to get to work, I had to make sure that I was getting the absolute best that I could afford. And the reality is that most of you listening probably do have a car, or you plan to drive one in the future. And in either case, you should listen up. When it comes to getting work done on your car, you're probably familiar with Kelly Blue Book. They're the go-to when you want transparent, objective information when you're in the market for a car or looking to get maintenance work done on your car but you may not know about Service Advisor. Service Advisor is designed to give car owners confidence that they are getting the right price for repairs and connects them with local service providers. Plus, it has information on common car problems and current recalls. When it comes to the amount of money you spend, getting and maintaining a car is a true investment. And Kelly Blue Book Service Advisor helps you make the best financial decisions possible so that you get the most out of your investment. With more than 95 years of experience, Kelly Blue Book is the trusted resource when it comes to car research, including new and used car pricing, repair and maintenance information, and advice for buying or selling your car, allowing consumers to navigate buying, selling, and owning a vehicle with confidence. Service Advisor provides insight on common problems that car owners face using data from services that others with similar vehicles have had performed, and a Q&A forum where owners can ask service-related questions so that you're never alone. Kelly Blue Book can also help you stay on top of maintenance and recall details, which ultimately lengthens the life of your vehicle, which means buying fewer cars in your lifetime, which is both more sustainable and more budget-friendly. They also offer repair forecasting, which allows you to assess the likelihood of major repairs. This can be super helpful when you're in the market for a car and can help you anticipate potential expensive services that you may need down the road, no pun intended, before they occur. The two foundational pillars of Kelly Blue Book involve instilling trust and confidence in car shoppers and owners. Learn more about Kelly Blue Book's service advisor at kbb.com or click the link in the episode description. So if you are basically anyone on the internet, your personal information is likely available to way more people than you'd think um, if they're willing to pay for it, which is honestly kind of terrifying. Um, I haven't talked about this yet on the channel, but my Twitter was recently hacked by a crypto scam and I've been in like a Kafka-esque journey to attempt to get it back, which has thus far not been fruitful. I've like taken it all the way to the Better Business Bureau to try and get some resolution here. But suffice to say, it was just like, it was a terrible experience and such a vulnerable feeling moment. Like luckily I haven't used Twitter in like six months. So it wasn't, you know, the end of the world for me on a personal level, but it also just reminded me like how vulnerable my data and information actually is. And of course I went and changed all of my passwords and things like that. But it was also a good reminder to be really careful about the types of personal information that is available about me online. So I signed up to use Delete Me um, for a test to test out the product. And they literally in the first report removed 61 instances of my personal information 
information that was available on data broker websites. So that was like my name, my address, my phone number, like all kinds of crazy information. Um, and it was just really scary to know that that's how vulnerable that information was. But sadly, there are companies out there called data brokers whose entire job is to collect huge amounts of your personal info, like your name, address, phone number, social security number, and even information about your relatives. The information is then sold online. But that is where Delete Me comes in. So Delete Me protects your data from data brokers, reducing the risks of identity theft, scams, and those annoying spam calls and emails that we all get. Their software and team of experts will not just find and remove your personal information from hundreds of data broker websites, but they'll continuously scan for new data that shows up and get that removed as well. Instead of spending hours of your time figuring out how to remove this data, Delete Me does it for you. Before you go into a panic, take control of your data by signing up for Delete Me. It's super easy to use and it simply works. Trust me, I use it myself. And they offer a special discount for our listeners. Get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeletemecom slash TFC and use promo code TFC. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeletemecom slash TFC and enter promo code TFC at checkout. That's joindeletemecom slash TFC, promo code TFC. How can you tell if you have enough clothes? I hate that I always want more. That's an interesting question. Um, if you always want more, you may be a really good candidate to put yourself on like some actual shopping ban and like give yourself some accountability with it. Like maybe do it with like a buddy or like post about it on social media or like join a subreddit or like find some way to like give yourself some structure and accountability to that. Because if you feel like it's airing into like shopping addiction territory or like hyper consumerism territory, like you may want to like pump the brakes entirely. Um, as far as what's enough, I think I personally, and I've talked about this before, but I always find personally that the the fewer clothing items I have, the more I enjoy my wardrobe, the better I feel in my clothes, because you're really just narrowing down your clothing to like the A-list items, the things you feel really good in, you look really good in, um, that fit you really well. You're putting more money into things like tailoring than you are into new items, um, and you're shopping more intelligently. Um, so I try whenever I do my like seasonal changeover to like eliminate as many clothes as I can. And if I'm ever like really attached, I'll just put it in storage for a season. And I usually don't even notice it's gone or miss it. But I would really try to like, even if you just put the clothes out of sight, out of mind, like try to do a capsule wardrobe of just your most A-list items for a certain amount of time and see what that brings you. See how you feel about your clothes when you're doing that. Um, I think it's I'm personally been very helpful to me. I shop way less now than I did 10 years ago, even though I have way more disposable income to shop with. I just am not as motivated to shop as I used to be. I also would in interrogate with yourself where this desire to shop comes from, because for me, when I was at my most compulsively shopping, it was because I really felt like I was compensating for a lot of insecurities. And I felt that like certain clothes, certain items, certain status symbols would make me be the person I wanted to be, would get me a certain level of um, validation that I wanted or acceptance that I wanted. And it was really only when I realized that like the people and like the validation that you want, like it, if it's meaningful, you would get that affirmation wearing a potato sack. Like it the people who are worth something in your life are going to care about you and like you for who you are, not what you have on your body. And I do like, that doesn't mean you can't enjoy style and self-expression, but it does mean that like, if you're ever consuming from a place of trying to buy your way into self-worth, like that is, you know, you're, that is a void that will never be filled. Any updates on the A Perfect Vintage audiobook? Yes. So as many of you might know, as some of you might know, um, there was a bit of a fracas with my initial audiobook plan. So the entire thing had to be scrapped. Um, so I had to re-record it myself, um, which I did. Um, and it honestly came out great. Um, it was in beta for a month with a book club that I was a part of. Um, and now we're just in final quality control, making a few edits and it will be released very soon. It just has to go through, um, audibles. Uh, it just has to go through audibles approval. Um, but don't worry, I will share far and wide when it's out. Um, a lot of people have been asking me for it and I cannot wait to share it. Um, because I've been through <laughs> trials and tribulations to get this thing across the finish line. Um, so yeah, so, 
we have that. I have um, the edition, uh, the exclusive edition with Indigo that's coming out soon. So I'll be, you know, in Canada doing some stuff for that. There's a lot of other exciting things happening with the book behind the scenes. So um, yeah, it's been a it's been a great time, and now I'm really excited that like the really intense time of my novel is over, and I can just sort of like, you know, passively and you know take opportunities as they come and promote it um as you know as is appropriate but I don't have to feel like I'm like pedal to the metal mode anymore which was um you know energizing but frankly unpleasant sometimes so yeah that'll be it's a nice era for me but all that is to say audiobook coming very soon and if you've ever thought to yourself well what does Chelsea Fagan sound like playing a sexy Frenchman you you will no longer have to imagine. You will be able to find out for yourself. If you could go back to your early 20s with your current money knowledge, what would you do differently? To me, I honestly kind of feel like in some ways, like whether it's with money or relationships or lifestyle choices or geography or friend groups, like to some extent, your 20s are about like, trial by fire and learning through error and like putting yourself into situations that you don't like because so and and that don't feel good and that aren't a sleigh because I feel like so much of so many of our best habits our best ideas our most clarifying moments are when we're like oh I don't like that that didn't feel good that was a tough lesson to learn and so when I look back at some of my mistakes and some of the things that I um, would not like objectively do now, I think to myself, well, how much value did it give me to learn that lesson the hard way and experience the difference, um, whether that was getting into credit card debt, defaulting on that debt, you know, um, losing a lot of money on really stupid mistakes, um, you know, whether it was traffic violations or, you know, not properly filing taxes, like all kinds of like stupid, stupid stuff that like, yeah, it did make my life pretty difficult for a time. But at the same time, like I definitely feel like if it weren't those mistakes, it would have been others. Like I would have made, I, I, it turned out that I had a pretty good internal compass for things like relationships and things like my work and, and things like that. So there are ways in which I made really amazing decisions in my twenties that I'm really happy with. So this is not to say that you should automatically look back and say, wow, like, um, you know, I regret absolutely nothing. All of that was perfect. 10 out of 10, no notes. It's just like a reminder to yourself to be kind with the things that you maybe did quote unquote wrong during that time in your life, because that's part of being a young adult. And if it weren't those lessons you learned, it probably would have been others. And the value that those lessons gave you usually makes your conviction to do differently in the future even stronger. Like, I don't think I would have been nearly as motivated to be financially savvy and solvent if I hadn't experienced the really rough reality of not doing those things. Now, that being said, like there are a lot of mistakes. Like I, for example, didn't go to college. I mean, I went to a community college, but like I didn't take out any student debt really. So I didn't have, I don't walk around every day with like a burden of like hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that I don't know how I'll pay. And I think those quote unquote lessons are much harder to live with. But I also think like, the least you can do for yourself is release yourself from the guilt of having done that to your future self because you were making what you thought was the best decision at the time with the information you were given by the authority figures around you. And obviously do the best you can now to avoid similar decisions and to, you know, reduce the burden on yourself. But at minimum, don't like burden yourself with more regret over something that again, like was the best decision you could make at the time with the information that you had. And in terms of just like advice for 20 somethings, I think ultimately this may be a controversial take, but I think when looking back at my twenties and looking back at young adulthood generally, ultimately the most defining features of your life will be the people that you surround yourself with. Like you can make a lot of mistakes. You can, you know, work a shitty job sometimes, you know, do crappy things, 
wear stupid outfits, get too drunk, like stay out too late, do all the 20 something, whatever. But like the people that you have as your close friends, as your romantic partners, as the people whose advice that you really take, as the people whose opinions matter to you, like that is ultimately what really shapes you. And the better, like the more you can surround yourself with people who make you better and improve your quality of life, the better it will be because you can make great decisions. But if you're surrounded by crappy people like that will, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's very much true that you do become sort of like an amalgam of all the people you surround yourself with. And especially when it comes to like your closest friends and your romantic partners, like you can lose many years and incalculable self self worth and self confidence um keeping the counsel of people who don't actually like you for you or who don't have your best interest at heart or who need you to be a different person to prove your value to them like you can you can lose a lot of time like that and my truest regrets when i look back at that time are the people that i associated with who made me a worse person okay this is a hilarious question cuz it's like i don't think it was intended to be but it's just funny. Um, how are you a co-founder of TFD when it used to be part of Hank Green's brand? Um, just so everyone knows, so I started the financial diet personally as a Tumblr to track my own finances. And then on the third day of having that Tumblr, my co-founder wrote to me, um, she's a designer who was working at an ad agency and was like, I would love to design this. And we founded the actual LLC together. That's my co-founder. We were given a $5,000 grant by Hank and John Green's foundation that we used to like set up the company, but they didn't like have any stake. They gave it to us as a grant to support what we were doing when it was still just a Tumblr. And then about a year later, a little under a year later, Hank approached me and my co-founder to do um, a YouTube channel based on our pre-existing brand. So for the first few years of running this YouTube channel, we co-owned it with Complexly, which is Hank and John's YouTube video company or YouTube production company. And then after a while, they we asked to go independent and they gave us back all our IP and we've been independent ever since. But at no point did Hank ever own any part of the Financial Diet, TF Diet LLC. Um, he did not start any of it, um, but he has been a great supporter, a great mentor, and just like a real, just a chill dude um, who was much kinder to us in the whole IP stuff and um, the legal stuff than I think a lot of other people in this industry would have been. So really nothing to say about um, about King Hank. Okay. If I'm a man and I see you out in New York City, is it okay if I come up to you and say hi and ask for a picture? Yes, dear. Um, anyone who's like sweetie pie enough to ask a question like that, yes, you can ask for a picture. That's very sweet and respectful. <laughs> Is there any advice you have previously given about finances that you don't follow now? Um, Yeah, I mean, tons in the sense that like when you're first starting out on your financial journey, you have to be so much harder and more diligent on yourself and more vigilant about your finances than you need to be once you get better about it. Like now I'm in a place where I don't have to be nearly as vigilant. Like I basically don't really have a budget anymore. I just do the pay yourself first method and then like spend anything I want after and like generally live below my means. So I don't really have to worry about my money. Um, which is not at all how it used to be. Like I used to have to be like really aggressive about my budget and I was really stressed out about like every purchase. Um, and I think that's kind of the goal of money is like, if you're, if you get the better you get with money, the less you have to think about it, the less it has to be a proactive part of your life, the less you have to, um, manage it and manage yourself. And so for me, like a lot of the, and it's not that I don't follow the general rules, right? Like I spend less than I make, I save and invest wisely and I prioritize my future self. But like all of the more nitty gritty, minute things, like I used to check my credit score like friggin' 10 times a week. Now I like barely do it because I just don't need to. Like I have a much better handle on my finances overall. Like I check for fraud and stuff, but like I just don't have to um, man like micromanage myself the way I used to. So it's not to say that that advice is not good anymore. It's just that I don't need to follow it. And I think for most people, that's generally part of the goal of becoming better with money. Where should I start when managing a budget or sharing household expenses with my partner? 
Um, so I think one thing to really consider is how much you're each respectively making, because there's a difference between like equal and equitable, right? Like if you, if one person makes four times more than the other, splitting things 50, 50 is not fair. Um, so I think that's definitely a part of it. Also totally decoupling the concept of domestic labor from, um, wage earning labor. Like just because you earn more money does not mean you should be doing fewer household tasks. It doesn't mean you have less responsibility when it comes to things like child rearing or home maintenance or any of that kind of stuff. So making sure that you're starting from a a place of equity um, and um, respect for the places that people are at mutually and you are valuing domestic labor equally. Um, I think that's always really important to start. I think it's always very important when you share your finances with someone to have your own separate finances as well so that you can have your own kind of discretionary budgets that the other person doesn't have to approve or be part of. I think it's a little bit of a it's like financially codependent in my opinion kind of to have 100% of everything be combined and have to have like total approval on both sides for every purchase. I think it's better to have just some discretionary spending on either side, whatever that amount might be that doesn't have to like be subject to like board approval. Um, or that the other person doesn't even have to be aware of. Like I simply don't know how much money my husband spends on video games and I never will. And that makes my life better or board games that he like, he loves to just buy a board game, like read the rules really thoroughly, set up the game, like understand it from like a 360 perspective. And then like, it just lingers in the game cupboard. Um, do I think that's a bit of a waste? Yeah, I mean, he'll play it like once a year, but like that's, he just loves learning games. And so that's a, an expense that I would never personally understand or justify, but I don't have to because it's not coming out of my account. I think definitely trying to have some level of alignment on what is actually worth spending on to you is extremely important. Like I can't stress enough how much resentment it can create when you are having to spend on things that both parties like bigger ticket items and more lifestyle choices that both parties don't feel good about um you know and and that can be i mean for example like the type of place that you're living in how much of your combined income you're spending on housing where you're living are you driving are you driving multiple cars like these really foundational aspects of your budget that will determine so much of your financial future like you it's really important to be aligned on those things um and I think it's always very good to, especially in the very beginning, set very regular check-ins around money. I think when you're very first living together and combining finances, I think once weekly might be better. And then as it, you know, it can drop down to a month and then maybe a quarter. We like to have um, biannual summits. Um, uh, where we, you know, do a lot of like high level planning. We're doing like a SWOT analysis. We're doing, you know, the big picture KPIs for the year. Like we like to treat our marriage um, as like a little, you know, little startup where we're, we got all these projects in the, uh, you know, in the hopper and we're focusing on different goals and, you know, planning everything out and really trying to decide as a couple, like what's important to us? What do we want to invest in this year? What do we want to grow? What do we want to spend on? Um, and we make it always like a fun evening. Like we'll go out and like, you know, get a nice dinner and do it. And, you know, we try to treat it as like something that we're doing as like an exciting, um, you know, it, it's, what am I looking for? Like we, we try to treat it as like a really exciting moment of like imagination and projection and taking care of our relationship on um, a practical level the way we would on a romantic level. So um, I highly recommend doing stuff like that. Um, yeah, but otherwise, I think it's really good to be asking these questions. It's a good sign for your sort of like romantic and emotional health with your partner. And um, I think you're on the right track. How do I manage expectations with gifts before the holidays? Figure out what you can afford to do. Think about who you want to prioritize when it comes to gift giving. There's usually going to be tears. There are people who might get actual gifts and people who will get things like cookies. And cookies are a very valid and delicious gift. Understand that you're not going to be able to give like bespoke gifts to every single person you know, and that's okay. Understand that homemade DIY, et cetera, gifts are just as valid as any other gift, and in some cases better. Decide what your budget is. Decide what you can afford to do. Make no apologies for it. Make no excuses for it. 
and give with love give with intention you can do like cute little handwritten notes you can do all kinds of little things you can see people you can you know a phone call it goes a long way like do what you can within your budget and anyone who would judge you for not being able to give a more lavish gift or a more um you know sort of brand name gift or whatever it might be or who would look down on getting a baked good or a diy item like that is not your problem that is nothing to do with you as i said earlier like gray rock gray rock that stuff because it is just that is a battle you will never win and people who would look down on you for staying within your budget while also creating thoughtful gifts for people is truly someone whose opinion not is not worth considering any advice for wanting to quit a toxic job without anything lined up i still have student loans do not quit a job without something lined up like unless you are in like a very severe situation where you're mental, physical, emotional health is like severely at risk. If there's no way you can cope, if you're in a dangerous situation, if you're in a in a legal situation, like try to tough it out with at least some option lined up because this is a this is a really rough job market right now, but b like whatever mental health effects that you are feeling from having a very toxic workplace, which I do not want to downplay, like they can be terrible. I've been in a toxic workplace. I know how it feels you could put yourself into an even worse position by suddenly throwing yourself into total financial and professional instability. Like it's going to take some work on the back end. You can speak to headhunters. You can do cold calls. You can, you know, submit your application different places. You can brush up your LinkedIn, your portfolio, your personal website, all of these things. Make sure you are in a, a great place. Find as many options as you can. Even if you're doing cobbling together gig work for a bit, like do not leave yourself in a position of just jumping into the void with no options and no backup plan. Because again, especially in this job market, that is just such a precarious place to put yourself in. And it can be like, absolutely, you should leave a toxic environment. Absolutely, you should, you know, get yourself out of there as soon as you can. But you are really not doing yourself any favors from a financial or mental health perspective to do it with absolutely no backup. Um, And it can also be it can make your resume even more complicated. It can be something that's now difficult to explain to future employers. Like, try to make the best and most seamless story that you possibly can because it's about setting yourself up for better opportunities in the future. Would it be amazing to go in there like that scene from Half Baked and just be like, F you, F you, F you, you're cool? Like, of course, we all dream of doing that at different times. But try to hold it out as much as you can until you have at least something lined up. If you can't do it from like a career maintenance perspective and find something that's like an actual career move, at minimum find something that will keep you financially protected. You don't want to have to, well, A, I hope you have an emergency fund if you're even considering doing this. If you don't have an emergency fund, you like literally can't just quit. But if you do have an emergency fund, you don't want to just sit there and drain it. Like, an emergency fund should ideally be used for like when you find yourself unexpectedly without a job because that is like, you know, that can happen at any time too. Um, But I hear you. It's a terrible situation. I'm sorry you're in it. Um, And I wish you the best of luck. But yeah, please try and set yourself up. Anyway, guys, that's it for me this week. I'll be back next week with a very exciting guest. And in the meantime... Tune into another episode of The Financial Confessions, all new, next Monday. And between now and Monday, check out our YouTube channel for all kinds of great stuff. I have my show once a month on Tuesdays. We have the money conversation with real people talking about money. Too Good to Be True is going to be coming back soon. I have a really exciting new thing in the works as well. Um, Yeah, a lot of cool stuff is happening on the YouTube channel. Check it out. See you next week. Bye. 